Good morning, everyone. I'm Esther Verney, and I'm a new member of our leadership advisory team here at Bethany West Seattle. This is Zach, and we want to welcome you to our worship service today. Can you say welcome? Oh, oh good job. Uh, we're so glad you joined us. Um, we're going to start with a call to worship and a couple songs. Um, then there's going to be some updates about what's going on in our church community. And then we'll end with a message from the Bible. Today, we're also going to take communion together at the end of the service. So um, take a minute to grab some bread or crackers, juice, wine, whatever you'd like to use um, to get ready. And then right after the service, we'd love to have you join us for our coffee connection. The Zoom link for that is um, in our weekly emails we send out. It's also in the link tree that's in the chat here. Uh, we believe that God loves you deeply and he wants to connect with you today. So let's pray. God, thank you uh, for being our source of hope and for bringing us together for worship this morning. We want to receive from you today, and we trust that you will meet us with what we need. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Let's worship together. This morning, our call to worship is from Mark chapter 11. Uh, this is Palm Sunday, so reading a passage about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back shortly. They went out and found a colt outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. with fire the whole earth shakes the whole earth shakes I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin the people sing the people sing
we do say Hosanna, Jesus, as you um, remind us of um, your calling and your faithfulness to us during this week of Holy Week. We follow you and we receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We would like to share with you some opportunities in our church community for connection and support and service this week. We hope that you will consider taking part in these. First thing is we're going to continue to share videos on Instagram and Facebook for community Lenten scripture and prayer practice. This is the final week of Lent, which is Holy Week, the week leading up to Easter. The scriptures shared will follow Jesus' words and actions through the final week before his resurrection, and we invite you to join us in this practice. We will also have a couple of special services this week. The first one is our Good Friday service. Um, This coming Friday, April 2nd, it will be at 7 p.m. And we'd love to have you join us online or in person at Bethany West Seattle. We will hold space for lament and grief as we meditate on this day of Jesus' death. We will also wait with anticipation and expectation for the joy of Easter, which is our next service this week. And we invite you to celebrate with us on Sunday, April 4th at 9.30 a.m., whether online or in person at Bethany West Seattle. And if you would like to participate in either of um, the in-person options this week, remember that you can register through the link tree. And if you forget, don't worry, you're welcome to show up and just register um, on site as well. That's totally fine. Bethany's involved in ministry both here in our city and around the world with our global partners. And you're welcome to participate and support these efforts through your tithes and offerings. And there are links for giving in our link tree as well. And one partnership in our developing relationship uh, is our developing relationship with the Duwamish. And so as we continue the service, here's a short video about that partnership. In Jeremiah 29, God instructed his people to seek the welfare of your city. And at Bethany Community Church, we believe this instruction is just as true today. Over the last few years, Bethany has fostered a partnership with the Duwamish tribe, the host tribe of Seattle, a tribe whose lineage dates back thousands of years. The Duwamish tribe are the indigenous people of Seattle, been here over 10,000 years. And Duwamish means the people of the inside. I think one of the the values that I appreciate is the way that we hold up our elders. They're lifted up very highly in our society. And as Bethany continues to seek ways to serve and learn from the Duwamish elders, the common thread of Christ's love runs through the center of our partnership. I am just so honored that the church, the Bethany Church has been so helpful and supportive of the Duwamish tribe for many, many, many years. And I am just so honored to know you all. 
I don't share this too often, but I'm steady praying for everything, you know? I'm a, a silent prayer warrior. <laughs> I know a lot of healing that has to take place between the church and Native people. I would just pray for healing and reconciliation because I believe God the Creator has, has revealed Himself to all of us. The strong bonds the Duwamish have for one another and the incredible care they have for their community continues to push them forward. Join us in praying for the Duwamish and praying about ways you can join in this important work, a work of reconciliation, hope, and ultimately seeking the welfare of your city. Well, good morning, everybody. Prentice here. I get the privilege to be the lead pastor at Bethany West Seattle. And I'm so glad you joined us today, uh, where today signifies a very important, sacred, and holy Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday. It's the day that initiates Holy Week, ultimately culminating with Easter. It's a day that the church has recognized as Jesus walking into or actually coming into on a, on a donkey uh, to Jerusalem, which we know only to be put to death on a cross and then to resurrect on the third day. And so this morning we focus on uh, Palm Sunday as we conclude our Lenten series uh, called Formed in the Wilderness. And this morning, uh, I want to call this uh, being formed in our failure. Being formed in our failure. So let me pray and we'll get started. God, thank you <clears throat> that we get to celebrate and honor the day that you came into Jerusalem, really with us in mind. So thank you for your life, your death, and your resurrection on the cross. And to that end, this morning we pray specifically, of, again, for the violence that happened in Atlanta, for the families that are grieving, for the Asian American Pacific Islander community that are also grieving. God, we pray for uh, the death uh, in Seattle at, our, at the Community Passageways meeting. You would be with the family, the families and the communities that are surrounding that loss. We especially pray for the violence and the death that happened in Boulder, Colorado. These experiences we give to you and we ask for mercy. We ask for wisdom. We ask for peace. And we ask for restoration and reconciliation. May we be agents of that. God, it's almost as if we have to pray every week about a new tragedy. God, be with our mental health, our spirits, and our belief. And then through all this, may we continue to believe that you are God and you are in control. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> It's been a hard couple of weeks. <laughs> it's been a hard year. Again, eight lives taking, taken senseless, senselessly in Atlanta, many of them being Asian women at Asian-owned businesses. Ten lives taken senselessly in Colorado. A person dead in Seattle at the Common Passageways meeting. Continued racialized violence against Asian black and brown bodies. And right now, a heightened and, and elevated sense of violence and attacks and racism towards the Asian American and Pacific Islander, the AAPI community. And it feels like there's been so much evil and, and tragedy that for me, and, and maybe many of you can resonate, I, I feel forced to move on from one grief to the other 
when I have not even finished grieving the one previous. But for a moment this morning, I just wanted to hone in on something that is extremely personal to me. And that is the senseless murders and the physical attacks and the harassment against the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And this even includes buildings and properties being, being vandalized, including churches, churches in Seattle, close to, to us, in our own neighborhood. It's happening. And though this kind of racism, uh, especially towards the AAPI community, has been happening for, for decades and decades, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I just encourage you to just do simple Google searches around the Page Act of 1875, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese internment camps. Uh, you Google the name Vincent Chin, and you'll notice that there's a large, not only, but a large common denominator within all of these tragedies and events in our history. And the common denominator that we see throughout many of these, even in the pandemic that we see today, is this issue of blame. Of blame. Right now we, we see heightened racism towards the AAPI community because there's blame on them, on me, on us regarding this virus, this, this pandemic. Blaming uh, has it's existed from the beginning of time, which we'll see, and, and oftentimes many blame an entire people group based on skin color. Uh, there's blame for the loss of jobs throughout history. There's blame on, pe uh, on certain people uh, due to the lack of our own safety. Again, there's blame on a people group because of this pandemic, particularly the AAPI community. And, and, and we all know and we've all felt this, that there's something very satisfying about blaming. There's something very satisfying about identifying fault. And, and oftentimes that's fault in, in somebody else or, or a group of people. And it's usually typically not on our own selves. And we know that blaming doesn't change any circumstance, doesn't make anything better. We know that. We know it doesn't. But there's something satisfying about blaming because I would argue that it does at least at least two things. One, uh, it justifies, uh, and two, it frees us. It justifies and it frees us. First of all, it justifies us of our attitudes, our behavior, our treatment of other people. It justifies what we do and say towards that group is at fault. That is at fault. And it frees us from any responsibility. It frees us from taking an internal look at our own selves and even in ways that we may have contributed to the conflict or to the violence or the, or, or, or the hurt or, or the pain. Because we, at the end of the day, we say it's not our fault. It's your fault or it's their fault. And again, this sense of blame is satisfying because it justifies us and it frees us. And we see that blame has been around since the beginning of time. We see that in the first humans. Uh, when God's command to the first humans, Adam and Eve, was simply do not eat of this fruit. You can have anything else you want, but do not eat of this fruit. And to make a long story short, they, they ate of the fruit. And what happens after is that God rhetorically asks, what happened? What made you do this? Then Adam blames Eve. Then Eve says, well, the serpent did it. And there's this chain of blame. And even in the story of the Exodus uh, that we've been in uh, through the, throughout this entire series, we, we see this clearly in Exodus chapter 32. Let me just set this up for you. The, the Israelites are moving through the desert, moving from captivity from Egypt and slavery from Egypt to uh, the promised land of Canaan, a land filled with milk and honey. But this whole journey took 40 years of wandering. 
and they were led by Moses, and let's just say Moses' co-leader or co-captain, Aaron. And Moses oftentimes hears from God throughout the entire journey uh, and becomes the messenger uh, for God to the Israelites. And at this moment, in, in Exodus chapter 32, Moses goes up into Mount Sinai, hikes on top of Mount Sinai to, to, to hear from God in order to relay the message uh, to the people. And apparently, when Moses was on top of Sinai, just praying and, and waiting and being still to hear from God, the people at the bottom of the mountain, the Israelites, they, they grew impatient. They panicked. They're like, where is Moses? In other words, where is God? And so out of panic and anxiety and this need to worship, they go to the co-captain. They go to Aaron. And they say, Aaron, Moses is taking too long. We need, we need to worship something or somebody. And so here's what it says in <clears throat> chapter 32, verse 2 to 4. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, Mount Sinai, they, gather, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, like as if they don't know Moses anymore, as for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And then Aaron, the co-captain, uh, answered them, well, take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So Aaron is giving them commands, take off the earrings and bring them to me. Verse 4, he took what they had handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning with, with, with fashioning it with a tool. So you can see that, that Aaron is, is being very proactive. Says, okay, I'll do something about it. Bring me your jewelry. And then it says that Aaron made it a, uh, into an idol, into a calf, and he himself even fashioned it with a tool. He took a tool to carve out a calf. And then finally, to end the, this passage, says, Then they said, uh, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out up from Egypt. Now, to add insult to injury, <clears throat> this wasn't too far long after God gives the Israelites the Ten Commandments, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, and part of the Ten Commandments, I'll just say right off the back, it says, do not worship any other gods before me. That's God's commandment, number one. Number two, do not make idols. And in this moment, in Exodus chapter 32, in the making of the golden calf, the people uh, being led by Aaron, the co-captain, broke the first two commandments. They worshipped another god. They created another image, an, an idol to worship, the golden calf. Uh, but I want, but but what I want us to take a look at now is Aaron's response. He says in verse twenty one in chapter thirty two, uh, he said to Aaron, "This is Moses. What did these people do to you that you led them in such great sin?" I love how that starts off when. Uh, in between these verses, God knows what's happening, the golden calf, and says, Moses, you have to get down the mountain. Your people are being so disobedient, so sinful. Go do something about it. Go stop them. And so Moses comes down and sees what's happening. In fact, it says earlier that Joshua, a person that may have not been included in the worshiping of idols, he also, even though he's there, he doesn't know what's happening. And so Moses is like, Joshua, what's going on down here with my people? And Joshua says, I don't know that. I think there's a war going on. I mean, there, there was so much chaos that even some of the people there didn't know what was happening. In fact, he thought it was there was a war. When it wasn't that, it was the disobedience of the Israelites creating and worshiping and celebrating this created image, uh, this idol. And so I love how Aaron or Moses comes down and says, Aaron, what happened? I left you in charge. And I can imagine Moses saying, dude, you had one job. <laughs> you had one job. 
And, and Aaron's response to Moses in verse 22 is this. Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. Time out, just real quick. Aaron is saying, hey, don't be mad at me. You know your own people. You know how they are prone to evil. You know how evil they are. Verse 23. This is what Aaron says. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <clears throat> Aaron begins with, hey, don't get upset with me. And then notice how he speaks ill of his own people. Uh, and this is where the blame starts to begin. Hey, Moses, don't look at me. It's not my fault. You know your people, the Israelites, they are just bent towards evil. This is this was their evil doing. This was their evil idea. Uh, and then he says, uh, all I did was take some jewelry and throw it into the fire. And then boom, out came this calf. It's almost as if it was an accident that this calf had occurred. And, you know, part of this is Aaron is lying. He's not even telling the truth. In, in his blaming uh, of the Israelites, he's not even telling the truth. Because the truth is what we read earlier is that Aaron asked for the jewelry. He melted it and he, with tools, with his own hands, shaped an idol in the image of a calf. And so a few verses later, all of a sudden that slips his mind and he says, look, it's your people, Moses, that did this evil. Not only that, all I did was take Julian and throw it into the fire and then boom, it's ultimately the fire's fault for creating a calf. It's almost as if Moses or if, sorry, if Aaron then just wants to wash his hands of taking any responsibility he blames the Israelites. In other words, he justifies his own behavior and he frees himself from any responsibility. Now, when we look at the tragedies that happened this week and last week and last summer and all throughout, uh, some of these are, well, they're all real. And yet to many of us, they feel sound extreme as if like we would never do something like that. They are the evil ones. They are the terrible people. They are the ones that made huge mistakes. They are the ones that need to be held accountable. And I agree 100 percent. Justice only happens when there's accountability. But in many ways, I also want to argue that you and I, we're also guilty of this, of, uh, of finding so much satisfaction in blame, in blame. Think about the last argument you had with a friend, a coworker, a spouse. Think about the last time that there was a failed project in the home or at work. Think about the moments in your life that didn't turn out the way you'd imagined. Or how when we need answers to why the world is the way it is, what do we do? <laughs> we go directly to blame. We blame ethnic groups as we've seen. We blame political leaders as we see all the time on the news. We blame the person we're in conflict with because obviously it's never our or my fault. We blame the person who voted differently than us and we see the mess of that on social media. We blame everybody uh, and anybody and yet fail to look into a mirror and ask the difficult questions of how we may have contributed into the mess. But I want you to pay attention now to Moses' response to Aaron. Now, you can imagine how you would react. I know how I would react, but here's how Moses reacts. The next day, Moses said to the people, and this is verse 30 of chapter 32, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sins. In other words, Moses is like, I will fight on your behalf. You made a mistake, but I'm going to fight on your behalf. In verse 31, so Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. This is Moses praying to God. 
But now, he says to God, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me. This is Moses saying to God, if you can't forgive their sins, please just blot me out of the book you have written. You see, the, the, the chain of blame could have continued. God, in his holy righteousness, says, what has happened? What is going on with my people? And Moses could have been like, God, look, Aaron did it. Then his people did it. It's a mess. I hear you. I'm with you. I had nothing to do with it. Wipe my hands of all responsibility. Free myself. Justify myself. That's, you know, if I'm being honest, that's what I may have done if I was Moses. But instead, there was this radical sense of humility. And I say a radical sense of humility because it's not a false sense of humility, but it's a humility that leads them to be self-sacrificial and self-giving. He says to God, if you won't forgive them, then I'll take the responsibility. Blot me out of the book you have written. And then we, we see this thread of what it looks like to be godly. It's to be humble. It's to be self-sacrificial. Uh, and, and we get led here to the life of Jesus, especially, especially in the lens of Palm Sunday. Jesus perfects what Moses does. Here in Mark chapter 11, verse 7 through 10, it says, When they brought the colt to Jesus, this donkey to Jesus, and threw their cloaks over it, Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches, like palm branches, this is where we get Palm Sunday from, uh, that, that they had cut in the fields. And they put it down for Jesus to, to come over, to walk over with the donkey. Verse 9, those who went ahead uh, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, which is a Hebrew word for God save us. It says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So Jesus knew why he was coming into Jerusalem. Ultimately to give his life for the sake of the world, for the sake of you and I, for the sake of the church. To overcome death and evil. This is why Jesus came to Jerusalem. This is why Palm Sunday exists. And the people there, though they were praising Jesus, didn't quite get it. If you understand kind of first century language and, and the politics of, of ancient Palestine, this was language um, of politics and, and nationalism. Jesus understood that he was going to be and he was the Messiah for the world. But not in the way that the people thought. Again, the language, the, blessed is you coming from the kingdom of our God, of our father, David. This is God. This was very political and nationalistic in nature. It's not exactly what Jesus had in mind. Hence, he came not with power and might, not as a military figure, not on a big horse or a stallion like any king would. But instead, he comes in on a donkey, a, a lowly donkey. Immediately, there's a sense of humility. And this humility brings them to the cross, to self-sacrifice. Humility then becomes the ingredient for restoration. And not just any kind of false humility, but a humility that is so radical that it becomes self-sacrificial, it becomes self-giving. This is a kind of humility that becomes the ingredient towards restoration, towards reconciliation, towards even our personal transformation. Again, not in just in our own lives, but in the lives with and for others. This is the kind of humility this radical humility that God invites us all into. It's a radical, self-giving kind of humility that says, I will go first. I will first confess. I will first ask for forgiveness. I will first take responsibility. I will first own the destructive nature of my behavior. Now, again, this doesn't mean to erase all boundaries and just say sorry for everything and take responsibility for everything. What I mean is we have to be telling the truth. And oftentimes 
we have to name the evil. We have to name the pain and the hurt that's been inflicted upon us without our say or our control. And if that has happened to you and is of impact and it has in, impacted your life, I am so sorry. And it's real. But setting that aside for a second, I'm talking about the situations where we just let our egos and our pride get in the way and humility is far. And the question is, what if we went first and call it self-sacrificing? Uh, but at the end of the day, that is what radical humility looks like. What if we let our guards down first? What if we realize that, yes, there are some atrocities happening in our world, like racism and violence like, like we've seen. And while it's, again, I'll say it again, it's absolutely essential to hold those people accountable. But what if we were humble, radically humble enough to acknowledge even our own minute, be that as it may, our own participation? We don't look at that because we want to free ourselves. We want to justify ourselves. But what if, for example, when it comes to the racism, uh, the deep racism that we've seen lately, especially in the Asian American Pacific Islander community, the deaths, what if that was just a long time coming from this perpetuation of uh, microaggressions, racist jokes, our own silence, our own going with the, with the status quo, our own objectification of Asian women. And oftentimes without even knowing it. That's a big thing to do right now. And I have to confront myself too. How have I played a role in what is happening in the world? And no, it may not be this direct impact. I'm not the one that walked into the spas. I'm not the one that may, you know, yell racial slurs at people or vandalize buildings. I may not have physically hurt or taken a life. And, and I would say many of you watching, you, you haven't either. But what if we took this radical first step into self-sacrifice, self-giving and say, I did something too. I let these jokes happen. I let racism happen. I didn't say anything. What if that is looking internally? What if we look at conflicts that we have with our significant other, our friends, our family, our coworkers, and say, what did I do? What, wh where do I need to take responsibility instead of just blaming and blaming and blaming? Because here's the deal with blaming. That does nothing. It gives us a, a false sense of security that we have no responsibility. And, and really the most dangerous part of blaming is that then we can't confess and therefore without confession, there is no repentance. In other words, taking all that Christianese aside, unless we confess and we, unless we acknowledge our wrongdoing, essentially acknowledge that we are not perfect, how do we know the areas that we need to transform and grow in? We can't. In order for us to change and transform to be not only better followers of Jesus, but better humans in the world, we have to acknowledge first where we need to grow in. But we'll never acknowledge that, know that, unless we begin with looking internally and stop blaming other people for everything. Yes, accountability is important and let's do that. But first and foremost, let's take ourselves accountable first. May we live like Jesus. May we be self-sacrificial like Jesus. May Palm Sunday teach us that it's not about blaming others. It's not about washing our hands of it. But it's about entering into the story and asking the question, what about me? What did I do? What can I do? And I promise this ingredient of radical humility will change the trajectory of all of your relationships with God, with others, even for yourself. So as we enter into this time of communion, and I'll be talking for, you know, just for a moment, so go ahead and grab, you can grab your piece of bread or juice or, or whatever you have, maybe it's right in front of you. But may I have this piece of bread and 
looks like water, but this is juice. May these <clears throat> elements remind us that Jesus came in with hu radical humility on a donkey. In Philippians, it says to die. God came down to die as a criminal on the cross. That is radical humility. That is self-sacrifice. That is self-giving. What if we took that on? And may this remind us to do that. May this Palm Sunday remind us to enter into our relationships with the donkey. And so then on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, take this in remembrance of me. This was my body that was sacrificed for you. And then he says, take this cup. This is my blood that was sacrificed for you with radical humility. Let's take of this bread together. Let's take of the cup together. Let's pray. God, thank you. Your, for your example of radical humility, of hospitality, of generosity, of self-giving. And instead of blaming others in our conflicts, in the mess of this world, and though accountability is necessary and important, may we, especially in a time like this, ask the question, how have A, how have I contributed, and B, because of my contribution, how can I be part of the solution? How can I be your hands and feet in the mess of this world? Help us, the church, to be even better examples of what it looks like to love and to be humble and to serve. We thank you. We pray for those that are hurting. We pray for those that are confused, that are angry, and these are the, maybe I'm projecting, these are the emotions that I feel. We pray for the marginalized. We pray for specifically the AAPI community, <laughs> my brothers and sisters that are hurting. We thank you, and we believe in you. We trust you. And as we enter into this holy week, may we be so reflective of your love, your compassion. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue in worship, a song of response. May we sing together, uh, and then I will see you at our Coffee Connection. Have a wonderful rest of the service. Everlasting rest.
trusting in the one who died for me what can i bring for your gift is complete so i trust you simply trust you lord with every part of this week. Amen.